Here at Equipping Godly Women, we are all about helping Christian women be all in in faith and family and becoming the amazing Christian women, wives, and mothers that God has created each of us to be. But sometimes we want to go a little bit further than just making ourselves better, and we want to have a positive impact on the world around us as well. That's why today I am so excited to talk with Ronnie Rock, author of the new book, One Woman Can Change the World, Reclaiming Your God-Designed Influence and Impact Right Where You Are. On today's podcast, we are talking about leadership, but not in the sense you probably think of the term leadership. We're not talking about climbing the corporate ladder or how you can run a corporation or lead a team. Rather, we're talking about how you can use the influence and impact that you have right where you are, whether that's as a mother or as a friend, wherever God has placed you, he has given you an opportunity where you can speak up and use your voice to positively impact and influence the lives of people all around you. So if this sounds like something that you would like to learn a little bit more about, you are ready to be all in in your faith and you want to help inspire other women to live a better God fulfilling life as well. I really hope that you will listen in to today's episode. Well, can you start by telling us a little bit more about your backstory, who you are, and what you do, and how you came to write this book? I'm Ronnie Rock. I live outside of Austin, Texas, in what's technically called Texas Hill Country, and I've lived here for quite a while. I am from Oklahoma originally, and then relocated to Texas as part of a career move, um, because the thing that I have done for, oh my gosh, Several decades now is vocationally, I do marketing. I manage engagement for Orphan Outreach, which is a global nonprofit. We work in eight countries around the world, I'm focusing our care on orphaned and vulnerable kids. I say that I'm a storyteller more than I am a writer and a conversationalist, and now an author um, of a book. Well, what really drove me to pay attention to your book when I noticed it for the first time online was that you talk about how women can change the world. And sometimes I think that for our listeners listening in, they might be thinking, okay, well, it's easy for you to go change the world. You have had these impressive job titles and you work in the nonprofit sphere and all of these things that you can do. And then I am a blogger and I have a podcast and I have these areas of influence or impact, but our average reader may not have as many, like maybe at home thinking, okay, that's great that you can go change the world, but how does that matter to me? And one thing that you said in your book is that your book is an honest look at what it means to be a woman of influence in a world that doesn't make it easy for women. So can you talk to me a little bit about what did you mean by that? You said it's not easy to be a woman of influence in today's world. Why is that? Sure. Well, first of all, what readers are going to find out is that the stories that are in the book are from the United States and other countries around the world. And that is what really helped me to understand that I had an opportunity to impact the world around me. Um, I, I may have a degree, I may have had a career, but I tell you when it comes to making lasting impact in somebody's life, I have dealt with that same sense of insecurity that unless I had a platform, unless I had an audience, unless I had the heft, for me, I'm a grandmother now, so it would have been, well, I should have started earlier. For somebody else, it'll be, oh, I'm too young, or I don't live in the right city, or I don't have the right complexion, or I don't have the right education. We take on so much um, self-shame to discredit who we are, to say that, that making an impact in somebody's life, that's for somebody else. That is for the person who has it all together, who has a five-year plan, who has a huge voice, who has a different tenor or a different personality. And so when I talk about it is in a, in a world that where leadership isn't easy, for some of these women, it is literally where leadership is not easy. It is, it, it is, it's cultures where women are systemically oppressed, where their voices 
are not supposed to be heard. Um, you're, you'll meet women who um, are doing amazing things in Guatemala where the legal marrying age only in the past what, five years has increased to 18. It was 14 for forever. So um, things, sim simple things like education for girls and things in many of the countries that you're going to read about are not, um, they are not accessible or their access is very limited. Now here in the U.S., it's a different feeling. We have a lot of issues that we need to face and we do have communities that are, um, are not given the same access um, or they may be given the same access, but they are not given the same liberty, if you will, right? Their access on paper, but when it comes to how we treat people, we may not give them that same leadership opportunity. Um, and for many of us, the, um, the limitations that we feel are cultural limitations that push us down that say, again, unless your voice sounds like this, Unless your life looks like this, then you don't have a right to speak into somebody else's life. And you don't have, an, you're, you need to, you just need to have more. If you just have more, or you had a better plan, or all of those things, then you can make an impact. So, um, again, that not easy, it varies for a lot of us. It really does, depending upon the country we live in, depending upon the culture we live in, uh, depending upon what we perceive as the opportunities that we're given and what culture says about us and how culture defines us. And so it then becomes um, an opportunity for us to say, just because culture says this, is it true? Just because... Um, government restricts, does that mean I, as a woman, am really restricted? Is that, is that limitation going to define me? Does, can it really define me? Or can I embrace it, allow it to refine my story and still be able to lead out right where I am? Well, one thing I thought was so interesting about your book is I tend to be more of a how-to writer. So my book that I'm working on right now, which won't come out until February, but is very, okay, you want to do X, Y, Z thing, which in my case is how to read the Bible. Um, but okay, you want to do this thing. So here is your step one, two, three, four, five. Like, here's what you do. Here's how you do it. Um, I come from more of a teaching background. So that's just very normal and natural to me. But your book, what I loved about it is that it's not a typical how-to manual of, oh, I've had all the success. And so now I'm going to tell you as the guru, like, here's all the things and like do all the things. Um, but as I've been reading through your book, it's very much just powerful stories of women in these other countries that you've had the opportunity to walk alongside and work with and you just sharing okay here's what it looks like so if someone reads a how-to book like mine they may be tempted to think oh well i can't do those steps or i can't do that for whatever reason but in your book there's just so many stories of these amazing, incredible women who are being leaders in their own sphere so that readers can really see, oh, this is what it looks like for her and this is what it looks like for her. And it doesn't have to look the same way that it is for me or for you. There's so many different ways to be a leader, um, or not even the term to be a leader, but to make a difference where you are in the exact place that God has given you because he's given you your husband, he's given you your children, he's given you your neighbors and the friends that you have and he's put you in this little pocket of community where you really can make a difference. Um, there was one quote in your book. Um, there were lots of quotes in your book. There was one quote in your book that I wrote down because it really stuck out to me. And that was, they knew that true leadership had to be relational, to be transformational, and yet they weren't trying to be leaders. Can you speak a little bit more about this topic of what does it mean to be more of a relational leader um, and what does that look like? So here it is at Genesis 1. And God creates the heavens and the earth and he gets everything all set for us to be able to, um, to for his prized possession, right? His, his, his pride and joy. He gets everything set for the earth and then he creates humankind. 
He creates man and woman. And in Genesis 1, it says that he creates them both in his image and likeness. He says, oh, this is so good. And then he looks at them and says, hey, this is all yours and I want you to lead. Now, he wasn't talking about, I want you to be the head of a corporation. He wasn't talking about, I want you to stand up in front of throngs of people and give them great three-step plans. I don't want you. This is not about that kind of leadership. This is about embracing how you are created by God himself with his DNA flowing through your body, with his desires for justice, his desires for mercy, his desires for community, those things that are in scripture from the beginning to the end, those are woven in us. They really are. And so it is, it's looking at those things and saying, not saying I need to be a leader and this is what a leader looks like. And I'm going to suit up and I'm going to, you know, I'm gonna go out and I'm going to stand on a stage and I got to be really big and I got to be really bold to be a leader. No, being a leader is looking around at your community, looking at your neighbor, helping to, to raise your kids in a way that reminds them that they too are created in image and likeness of a God who delights in them, who sees them as the apple of his eye, and who says, my work, I entrust it to you. I entrust you to be um, the heart and the hands and the voice of what redemption looks like and what restoration looks like and what hope looks like. And that leadership is not defined by a title. That kind of leadership is not defined by pedigree. It is not defined by heritage. It is not defined by a diploma. That kind of leadership is trusting that when God created us and he wanted to walk in the garden with us and have great conversations about life, and about our days, that we need to continue to trust that he actually does have our best interest at heart. And our best interest and the best interest of our neighbor are the same. They really are. We may not always see everything eye to eye. We may not always agree. We will certainly not have the exact same life experiences. We may not fully understand what the other person is going through. But the Lord's desire for community and love and hope and redemption, the fact that he does see a redemptive destination in every single one of us, and he's not a punitive God that sits around with a carrot in one hand and a baseball bat in the other, just waiting to see if we get it right and then bopping us over the head when we don't. He actually really is a father who cares enough about us that he wants to walk side by side with us as we walk side by side with others. That's leadership, honestly, that we need. And sometimes it may be speaking out on, on an issue that we know needs to be spoken out on, even if we don't have all the right words. Sometimes it means wrapping our arms around somebody and not saying a word at all, because what we know what they, we just feel that what they need right now is just God's presence and to be reminded that they actually matter. Yeah, I don't think that most of us really even think of these, um, think of this in terms of leadership because we are so focused on, oh, leaders have organizations or leaders have nonprofits or leaders have these things. And yet when I think in my own life of the people who have had the biggest impact in my life or who have made the biggest difference, it's not those influencers out there that I don't know that I read a couple Instagram posts of theirs. Or I mean, there's authors that have had a big impact on my life, but the people who have the biggest impact are the people that I am able to walk alongside every day. Like my mom raising me in the faith and my dad and my sister-in-laws and watching them in their marriages and being able to talk through whatever we're going on, you know, whatever we have going on on a day-to-day -day basis or talking with friends about 
okay, here's, here are the issues and what do we think about this and how can we respond to this? And I think that our listeners and readers here at Equipping Godly Women are in such a unique and special place with this, especially because here at Equipping Godly Women, we are all about, you know, just diving in and going all in and being the amazing Christian women, wives and mothers that God has created us to be. And so we are reaching for more and we're reaching to be better and reaching for more of God and more of his presence um, and to dive into that. And that's something that the world needs. And yeah, you can learn from your pastor and you should absolutely. Yes, you can get in the Bible and you should absolutely. But having those real women around you who can model, okay, this is what it looks like. Not that we're always going to get it right, but you know, this is what it looks like to try. And this is what it looks like to dive in um, is such an inspiration to those people around us that we probably don't even know. Yeah. If you, um, I talk in my book about Proverbs 31 and I love the whole chapter. Oftentimes we just read those last 22 um, verses and they can either be used to inspire us or they can be used like a sword to just rip us apart as women. Because we look at it and if you read Proverbs 31 and if you love Jesus, if you want to serve well, that is set up as kind of this like, here you go be a Proverbs 31 woman, right? And we can look at that and you read it. And if you read it without the whole context of the chapter, it can become an indictment because it, we look at it and it is, okay, I need to be married and I need to have kids and I need to have a cottage industry. And I, uh, gosh, I need to be able to negotiate and I need to be able to, oh, I should churn butter and then I should also negotiate a deal at Trader Joe's because I need to be an entrepreneur and I need to, you know, and, and then my husband better be super proud of me. So I better look stunning all the time and I just, I better be well-spoken and, and you look at that and you're like, I can't live up to that. I can't. Now the women in my book, some are married, some are single, some are widowed. So if I looked at the Proverbs 31 model, right, I would say, oh, only those of you who are married with kids who figured it all out, you're a Proverbs 31 woman. But you know what? These women, they're all, they are living out really what, if you look at Proverbs 31 just overall, it's a leadership. It's actually, you want to see, it's a leadership chapter. It is written by a man talking about what his mama taught him. And she is teaching him, first of all, be kind, be just, care for the poor, stand up for the folks who don't have voices, be a strong leader, don't be political, lead with people, um, lead lifting people, right? Be a person that sees, that sees life in all of its glory as the thing to be elevated. And, um, and then what does leadership look like? Oh, let me tell you about a woman. And then she starts to describe, and it wasn't, I don't think, for Lemuel. It was the, here's the laundry list. Go out and get yourself a wife. And if she ticks off all of the marks, then she's a good one. If you look and you start to view it in the context of what leading looks like, good leadership looks like, it's so inspiring because it is, you know what? She prepares for her day. She takes some time to prepare for her day. She looks around to see where there's need. And then she does what she can to meet the need. She thinks about things when there's plenty and try and does her best to prepare when there's scarcity so she can protect people. She has a natural nurturing heart. She looks around to see where there might be a great deal somewhere or a place that her voice would fit. She's honored not because she has it all together, but she is honored because her voice matters and she's impacting the lives of people around her. Okay, so let me ask you, what are some of the reasons why you think women in general don't step up into this role of leadership or influence that we could have with people around us? In the book, if you were to go by what defines a woman? And man, I've talked to so many women that are like, well, if I could only be married, then everything would be okay. I feel less than because I'm not married. I feel less than because I can't have kids. I feel less than because I'm a widow. 
I feel less than because I'm divorced or I'm a single parent or I didn't get an education. And we stack up the indictments against our souls the whole time the Lord is like, who is judging you right now? Who is silencing you right now? Which sadly in our culture in the United States, a lot of times we are so, we want to see success so clearly that we limit ourselves because we're like, well, I got to get, I, I need to build a plan. I got to get all mapped out. And when everything is perfect, then I'll take the first step. And scripture never shows people waiting for it all to be perfect to take the first step. So as Ina says, it's God saying, come on, just dip your toe in the water. Watch to see if the water parts a little bit. If it does, dip your toe in again. It's okay. It's okay. And he is delighting in us dipping our toe in the water and trusting that he is right there with us and that he is not going to set us up and he is not a big mystery and a big puzzle for us to try to figure out. His purpose is, has been, and always will be you. It was not you if you get it all figured out. It is not you if you do everything perfectly. It is you. He created you. And he created me. And we are his joy even in the midst of sin, even in the midst of ah, the chaos that is all around us because of, um, of other, of choices and, and things and generations that have come before us, even in the midst of all of those things, he still looks at you and says you're the apple of his eye to this day. And that should encourage you to want to walk near him and to let him speak to you and to trust him that, you know what, he is going to show you the ways that he wants you to be transformative in the lives of people around you. At the same time, you're going to be transformative. So let's get super practical for a minute. We have talked a lot about how God can use us right wherever we are and that God can use us whoever we are, if we're married, not married, any of, you know, whatever your life looks like, God has you where he has you and he can use you there. So can you give our listeners just some super practical ideas? What does that look like for our listener who right now is listening, who's thinking, okay, I know God has me here. I don't know what that looks like. I don't even know where to get started. How how could God even use me? Do you have any ideas along that line? I do have on my website, which I know you're going to share, I do have 15 questions to ask yourself. And I'll go through some of those. Well, first of all, just spending some time with the Lord and spending time in Scripture to say, okay, you know what? I first, I need to understand how you view me, Lord. How do you view me? I would like to know, will you... Help me understand. I'm just going to spend time because if I spend time with you and I'm going to journal, I'm going to journal out my fears. I'm going to journal out the things that confuse me. I'm going to journal out the things that frustrate me because you know what? Somewhere in those fears and frustrations and dreams and hopes will probably be the nugget of a step that you might take. Also, asking yourself practical questions about what things do I do that actually are like, what are things that I do that are life-giving to me? What are things that I do that are not? For example, I love to write. I love to take pictures. I am capable of accounting. Capable. But you know what? That's not my thing. It isn't. There are other folks that are extremely capable of at accounting. I can do it. But am I required to do it? No. So I want to stay in those areas where, where my gifts and talents are. And the way he has wired me spiritually, naturally, he has got me all figured out. He's got you all figured out. So what are the things that just are things that naturally are life-giving to you, even when times are hard? What are, what are conversations or topics that when you think about them, they make you want to learn more? They make you want to speak out. Um, what are dreams that you even had as a kid? 
that for some reason, even though the dream itself may have sound childish at the time, there's still something that ruminates in there. You're like, mm, I remember that. Are there certain people that when you're near them, uh, and it could be an age group, it could be um, an age, demographic, socioeconomic, whatever group that when you think about them, when you talk, that you just are naturally drawn to. To me, those are just simple things where you can just say, what is it that's in me? I'm a big assessment taker also. <laughs> I love taking assessments. I don't live and die by any of them, but I love how they inform pieces of us. So things like strength finders, spiritual gift assessments, things like that that just help you go, oh, huh, you know, now I've got some a little bit of context around why I do think the way I do or why I do process thoughts the way I do. I love that. Before we finish today's podcast episode, though, I always want to ask, is there anything else that you want to share with our listeners? Are there any points that you didn't have a chance to make or any last final parting words that you want to make sure that our listeners hear? So as far as telling somebody, oh, get on a website right now and pick a need, I can't, I can't do that. And, and I would tell you that the women in the book will tell you don't. And if you ask, ask all of them, a lot of them, their passion was born out of pain. It was born out of peace of their own life. Lisa, who has ministry to teen moms and their babies, why is that important to her? Because she was a teen mom and she remembered that everybody cheered for her to not abort. And then when it came time for them to wrap around this teenage girl to tell her how she might be able to figure out life. And I'm talking basics of life, like how to budget and, and what, and what resources are available and how do you, Go to school with a kid and stuff. It got really quiet. And she remembered that pain as a single parent and said, I don't want anybody else to have to go through that. I think I'll, I think I'll just sit and talk to some teen moms. So that's how hers was born. Um, there's Ina who had a great family, loved to homeschool. Kids grew up. She's like, man, I love homeschooling. I really love it. Maybe there's somebody in my community that might need tutoring. And before you know it, she had found a community that um, was an extremely impoverished community. It was in Honduras, the Scholars community. And she then went to her church and said, oh my gosh, I found this community and I want to help them because the kids are struggling in school. What can we do? And the, her church leaders looked at her and said, you know what? They're on the wrong side of town. So, man, we appreciate it, but they're on the wrong side of town, so really we can't do anything. And she will tell you, you don't wait for leadership. You don't wait. Sometimes you just don't wait until everything is figured out or until somebody in a position of authority tells you it's okay or whatever. Sometimes it's the nudge in your own heart, and you take that step. And now there is a program in this squatters community that is helping everything from early childhood development all the way through sixth grade. And those kids are thriving and they're growing in what was originally known as a program for kids that struggled that other kids made fun of them. Now everybody's like, man, I wish I was a Nico kid. But that started, and that was not her thing, is to make a big thing. Her goal was just... She just wanted to homeschool a kid. She just didn't have one. So she looked around. And that's um, auntie in India. Her original goal, she just wanted to tell people about Jesus. That's all she really wanted to do was to tell people about Jesus. But in looking around of who she might tell people about Jesus, she found out that there were a lot of kids that were suffering at the hands of abuse and stuff. And she's like, well, it's hard for me to tell people about Jesus if I see folks suffering and I, and I not helping. And so she ended up helping kids. And now she is a voice in her community 
and highly respected in in a community that is predominantly Hindu, where Christianity is less than 1%, you don't mess with auntie. Everybody protects her. But that started with a desire. She just like, I just want to tell people about Jesus. What am I going to do? In a country where telling people about Jesus is illegal. And she found that the best way to tell people about Jesus was to serve them like Jesus. So, and the stories, they just keep going on and on. And I will tell you that there is nothing in your life that can disqualify you from simply reaching out and caring for somebody else and seeing that your world starts with those who are around you. Well, I love the stories that you shared in your book. They're so inspiring. And thank you for all of the insight and information that you've given us today. This has been a wonderful conversation. Hopefully, as people have listened in, they have their wheels turning up. Okay, I am where I am for some kind of reason. God put me here. He has something for me. Um, I can have influence. I can have impact. No matter what kinds of things threaten to disqualify me, I can make a difference in my community. So hopefully this is very encouraging for people today. Thank you so much for your time today, Ronnie. I enjoyed it. I man, I hope we get to talk again. And whoever watches, if you want to talk further, I'm here. All right, so that just about does it for today's episode. If you'd like to learn more about how you can have a real impact wherever you are, I would really encourage you to check out Ronnie's book, One Woman Can Change the World, Reclaiming Your God-Designed Influence and Impact Right Where You Are. Whether you're a mama, you're a daughter, you're a sister, you're a friend, wherever God has placed you, he can use you there and he wants to use you to have a positive impact on the people all around you. So definitely check out this book if you want to learn more. I will leave links in the show notes to Ronnie's website and the 15 questions that she mentioned in our interview today. And then of course, as always, if you have not subscribed to the Equipping Godly Women podcast yet, what are you waiting for? We come back regularly to share all kinds of interviews with amazing Christian women on all sorts of topics to help you be all in as a Christian woman, wife, and mother, and to be that amazing woman God has created you to be. So definitely subscribe if you have not already, and we'll talk to you again real soon. All right, bye.